Lecture 57, uh, change of pace, we're moving on to new topics now. Uh, the relativity has been, you know, kind of tough because of uh, all the algebra involved. Uh, also, it's not very intuitive, and so it's, it's really hard to get the stuff right in your head because it doesn't comport with your sense of reality. Um, so, let's look at this today, center of mass. So we'll get to what I mean by that in just a minute, but if we look at this picture here of two people balancing on a seesaw, I think that's what they call it, a seesaw, right? Yeah. And I'm proposing that the distance from the, what we call the fulcrum, right, to the center, the balance point, uh, is L over 2, and this is L over 2. What can we infer about the masses of these two people standing on the ends there, if this is balanced? They have the same mass. Yeah, we can infer that M1 is equal to M2, and that's purely through intuition, right? Yes. Because we're familiar with seesaws. What about this picture over here? What can we infer about this? You can see that it's balanced, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, they do not have the same masses. Well, I've drawn it in a way. I didn't specifically say what this distance is, but I meant for this to be a longer distance yep. than this distance here. Yes. Yeah, I see it. Okay? So, what can we say about this? In terms of the masses. Is M3 equal to M4? No. Is M3 greater than M4? No. Is M4 greater than M3? Yes. That's what we can infer. Right? We can infer from our intuition that M4 is greater than M3. Yes? It's not too difficult, right? Yes. So we can see that we've got this idea of masses, but we also have this idea of distances, right? So what's different in these two pictures, right? This distance from the center point or the balance point is greater than this distance, right? So if I call this distance here, call this L3, and this distance here, I call this L4, right? We can see that L3 is greater than L4, okay? Okay. So we see that there's something important about this distance that changes the, you know, the, the equation, so to speak, what brings things into balance. Now, you may already be aware of this. It's called lever arm, right? And we'll talk about it more in, I think, the next lesson, which will be on things like torque. And so we'll talk about how you can get, uh, you know, you can screw in a, a tough bolt, right, by using a lever arm, right? Like if you're trying to change a tire and you get down there, if you try to twist it with your fingers, you're never going to get it, right? These lugs off of the tires. You need to get a good lever arm, right? And so it's the distance from the axis of rotation that's important, okay? Here the rotation, if they weren't in balance, of course, what would happen? Right, here's a meter stick. If they weren't in balance, then one side would fall and the other would rise, it would rotate. And we'll talk about this kind of rotational motion uh, in the next few lessons. So I think everyone, everyone understands this, yes? Yes. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove the masses. So I'll put my balance point here. I'm going to draw what appears to me to be uh, equal distance here, right? Call this L over, whoops, L over 2. And this will also be L over 2. But there are no masses on there now, right? Yeah. So why is it balancing? Right? Yeah, I can do this experiment. The masses are right? equal. If I put my, Zero. well, there are no masses. You say, oh, I see. See, it's because the masses are equal. Is that right? Yeah. So here I've balanced this meter stick on my finger. It looks like the balance point here is at about, oops, you know, it's not actually at 20. It's like at 19 and 3 quarter inches. Let's get a little more precision here. Oh, that's better. The balance point looks to me like it's at 50 centimeters. And this is, of course, a 100 centimeter stick. Yeah, 100 centimeters. So it's balancing exactly in half, OK? But there are no masses sitting on it. So what is it? Before we had, you know, we could have drawn, you know, we could have thought about it like this. Here's the person. Here's the other person, right? And we've got force M2 times G pulling downward. Here we have M1 times G pulling downward, right? And if M1 and M2 are equal, we can imagine that they're pulling down with equal amount, right? Yeah. And if the distances to the fulcrum are the same, then somehow this balances it all out. Their masses are the same, right? There's something else going on that we haven't explored, and we're not going to get that, to that today. But, but we're, there are no masses here, right? Yes. So how do we think about this? Well, if we imagine the ruler being made up little chunks of mass, this I'm going to call a delta m, okay? 
just a little chunk of mass. I'm using delta not because it's a change in something like we do when we say delta x as a displacement, but rather delta as a, a small amount, okay? Okay. So delta m, some little bit of mass. And the total mass of the ruler, right, I could get, I'll call the total mass of the ruler, m is equal to the sum over all of these delta m's, okay? So there'd be i of them, right? Yes. However many there are, however small I decide to divide it up into. So what I can say then, right, is that I can define something, we'll just call it a density, which is the mass per length. So I take the mass and I divide it by the length of the ruler. And if we assume that the composition of the material is uniform, right, such that the little delta m in this part of the ruler is the same as a little delta m over in this part of the ruler, right, then we can write the density as so, okay? And then we can say, well, that would mean that the little delta m that I got, right, is equal to lambda times some little delta x, right, where delta x is some displacement along the length of the ruler. And so at this point, we're going to define the total mass times this x sub cm for center of mass, okay, right. is equal to the sum, xi, so times some little delta m, okay? okay? And if I do that, I, I can sum up a distance times this little bit here, right? Add it all up, I should get this. Um, but let's sub, sub in delta m to this, and that's going to give me that this is equal to the sum, i, of xi times lambda times a little delta x, okay? Okay. So xi, remember, that's the position. We'll say that the origin is here, and so xi equals zero would be this point here. And as I went all the way out to here, this would be xi equals L, okay? Okay. I'm using the subscript i because we're kind of discretizing our division along the ruler, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Because I chopped it up into little pieces, right? Yeah. So as I move to the first piece of the second piece, when I move to the last piece, right, if there are, say, n of them, right, then I've arrived at a distance n times delta x, which will be equal to L, okay? Does that make sense? Do you understand that? Yeah. Just write that down. So L is going to be equal to N, some number, of, however many divisions we decide to make, uh, times delta X. Okay? All right. Now I want to draw a little graph. X, this value here is going to be L. And if I look at this, right, I can kind of see that there's something going on here where I can get a line. We'll go out. As we add these up, oh, well, I have to make L so far away. Looks right, right? Once I get to this point here, this is going to be equal to lambda times L. Because lambda is kind of the slope of my line here. Do you see that? Yeah. So I'm thinking of some graph of something which is lambda times whatever my x position is, right? So we call this lambda times x, okay? And I can see that as I add it up, right, eventually I'm going to be at L. And when I add all these up, right, what is the sum of them, right? Well, you can think of the sum as the area under this curve, right? This is our sum, this area under this curve here, right? And that curve, if you think about it, is half the area of that rectangle. So I can write that m times x sub c, m, the center of mass position, is equal to the area, where the area here, area, is equal to half of lambda l times l, okay? Because this is lambda l, that's the y position, right? And this is the x position, L. And half of that rectangle is this triangle here, right? Yeah. So this sum of whatever this is, right, is equal to 1 half times lambda times L squared. Divide by M on both sides, right? So I get x sub cm. What is this x sub cm? It's the center of mass. That's what I'm trying to compute here, okay? Okay. The center of mass is 1 half. And also substitute in for lambda. Lambda is M over L, right? M over L times L squared, and then divided by M, so times 1 over big M. You see that? Yes. The M's cancel, one of the L's cancel, and I'm left with 1 half L. So for a uniformly distributed ruler like this one, right, which is 100 centimeters long, the center of the mass, if it is uniformly distributed, right, is going to be equal to 1 half L. Okay? Okay. Now, when you get to a calculus-based physics course, you can compute centers of mass for all kinds of exotic shapes with all kinds of crazy distributions of matter. And you can imagine, right, that 
it is at one half L, one half of 100 centimeters is 50, and I put my finger at 50, and it balances pretty well. Okay? But let's say that it had, let's say that this end clip on this side was much heavier. Somebody made it out of lead or something, okay? Whereas the end clip on this side maybe fell off. So I've got this big mass on this side, right? Yeah. What's going to happen? It's going to tip down like this, right? Yeah. It's going to shift the balance point towards it like so, right? All right. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. And that would be a much harder problem to compute. It would not be a line like this as we looked at the, the density times the distance, right, versus distance, right? Yeah. It would be different. We see that once we got towards L, where the lead piece is, that the mass times length of the mass would go up because the density is higher there, right? The yeah. delta m's are much bigger, right? Yeah. So that's the idea of the, the center of mass, okay? All right. Now, without doing any calculations, let's think about what if I took a, a ring, right? I have a, I have a wedding ring, right? Yeah. Where is the center of mass in this wedding ring? Let's assume that it's the, the distribution of matter is uniform all the way around it. Where would you guess the center of mass is? Is it on the circumference of the ring somewhere? Could it be in the center of the ring, maybe? No. No. Couldn't be there, right? Of course, that's where it is. It's in the center of the ring. Now, we could prove that. Typically, you would use calculus to do a problem like that. I think you might be able to do it without calculus, but I did not think about how to go about doing that. But so that's the, the, the concept of uh, density, right? So we think of this ruler as being composed of little mass segments, right? Yeah. And we're going to calculate the center of mass using this step. Oh, I erased the definition. The definition was that the total mass times the center of mass is equal to the sum of the individual masses times their distance from the origin, okay? okay. So times the displacement, if you will. Gravity, when it acts on something, it acts on the center of mass, okay? And so that's what we're going to try to come to understand uh, in this lesson, all right? All right. But first, just a little more definitional stuff. So we already had that mass times the center of mass is equal to the sum i, uh, really m sub i times the x sub i, right? You could replace the m sub i with the delta m if they're all the same, okay? Right. Now it's a constant. But if it's not all the same, if some little components of it are heavier, then you have to write it this way. Does everyone remember the sum notation? Maybe I should explicitly write this out. What is this equal to? This is equal to m1 times x1, that's the distance to, from the origin to piece of mass 1, okay. plus the mass of little piece 2 times the distance of it, uh, distance it is from the origin, right, plus dot, 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 all the way up to m sub n times x sub n, okay? Well, I guess I could have said i. Now, usually we go i runs from 1 to, say, n, okay, such that m is equal to the sum of all the little m sub i's, okay? So the next definition I'm going to introduce is the idea of momentum, p, and I guess we could call this cm, is equal to the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass, okay? And that is going to be equal to the sum i to n, m sub i times v sub i. If we take a bunch of particles, they're all moving around in different directions, right, with different speeds, right, and their masses, and add up the sum, and this could be a vector, for example, so you have the vector sum, it could be in one dimension, it's either going in the positive or the negative direction, right, yeah. add them all up, that will be equal to the momentum of the center of mass. And we're going to talk more about that in just a second. So if there are no external forces, what do you expect the center of mass motion to be? What do you expect the velocity of the center of mass to be? If there are no external forces, remember, we want to think of objects as being a collection of a system of particles, right? Yeah. And if there are no forces acting on it, will there be an acceleration? No. No. So if there's no acceleration, that means that its velocity is zero or a constant, right? Some value. Yeah. You could be moving along at you know, one meter per second. You could be sitting still, right? Yeah. So if the velocity of the center of mass is constant, right? So if there are no external forces, then BCM equals a constant, which implies that PCM equals a constant. Okay? So the momentum would be equal to a constant. So let's think, what would a system like this look like? Let's look at it over time. So let's assume it's not bound by anything. We just have a collection of particles. Let's say one, two, three particles. Yeah. And if we say, okay, where's the center of mass of this? Let me draw it a little more uniformly. Here we go. 
we have some little axis I've drawn here is probably the center of mass. Intuitively, you can kind of see that it is, right? Yes? Yes. If it was in one dimension, then it would just be in the center of the two dots, right? Yes. But since I've added a second dimension here, so we're a two-dimensional object, you can see the center of mass is in the center. This is a point that's equidistant from all of these other points, right? Yes. And so as time goes on, maybe this one's got a velocity that's headed outward, right? So a, time, a little time later, this will be out here. Maybe this one is over here somewhere. Maybe this one just hasn't moved all that much, okay? So you can think of like a cloud of material that's just diffusing. It's just getting thinner out in space. Everything is going off in their own little directions. But the center of mass will remain unchanged, okay? Okay. That will be stationary if there are no external forces acting on it, okay? If I can define a velocity, a center of mass for the velocity, I can define an acceleration for the center of mass. And if I multiply that times the total mass, what do you expect that to be equal to? Anyone remember what m times a is? Force. Force, right? Yes. More specifically, it's the sum of the forces external, external forces. So if there is an acceleration, right, then the center of mass velocity is not zero. It will be moving, okay? okay. So where are we going with this? Let me see if I can show you what I mean by this. So let's say that I threw a, a point particle on a trajectory here on Earth, in Earth's gravity, near the surface. So all we have is g is our acceleration, right? Yeah. The trajectory might look like this, right? It might go up. It's going to be a parabola, and then come back down. Yes? Yes. Here's the ground. Now, what if this was a ruler that I threw, right, or a pen, and when I threw it, it was spinning, right? Yes. What would that look like? That trajectory, you would think, oh, God, that'd be a horribly complicated trajectory to have all the spinning plus the gravity acting on it. That must be tough, right? Yeah. Because you really, gravity is acting on each individual little particle that make up the, the pen or the ruler that I throw, right? Yeah. Yes? But the center of mass motion would actually be very simple. You can imagine that it, Maybe it took off, it was flat, and then it started rotating in a clockwise direction as we went along this trajectory. Right? You see, it, it might rotate, and that might be complicated, but the center of mass of this ruler is going to follow that nice parabola. Okay? Okay. Let's look at a, a simpler example. Again, we'll use the, this parabola, right? If I launch something up, it travels this parabola. Let's say that what I launch up is a shell, it's an artillery shell. Okay? It's headed up this way, but when it gets to the top, it explodes, okay? Such that one piece is basically going to fall down almost, right? And the other piece is broken off. So it breaks off into two pieces. And let's say that this piece, right, just kind of takes a path down like this. And maybe this piece lands like this, right? Yeah. But the center of mass, right, will remain the same throughout, okay? Uh, you probably remember the bullet and the block problem. It was an example of an inelastic collision that we did. I don't remember what lecture it was. I'll try to put it in the text on the video. But uh, the bullet, we could say, had a velocity. We'll call it V1I. Let me draw it a little bigger. V1I equals 400 meters per second. And we'll say that M sub I, or M1, the bullet, I guess I could have used VB, is equal to uh, 0 0.01 kilograms. So it's 10 grams. Okay? All right. And the block, V2 initial was equal to 0, and its mass, V2, was equal to three, uh, 390 kilograms. So 0 0.39 kilograms. 390 grams. Okay? All right. And then after the bullet impacts it, it embeds itself into the, the block and comes to rest. And we get some final velocity. Both of the, the bullet and the block are moving together at the same speed, right, in this direction. And uh, the mass is equal to, well, 0.4 kilograms. That's the mass of the block, 390 grams, plus the mass of the bullet, 10 grams. That's 400 grams, or 0.4 kilograms. You probably remember this problem uh, from that lecture where we talked about inelastic scattering. So let's see if we can calculate the center of mass momentum, okay? And we'll do that by looking at the before picture, right? So this is the before. This is the after. And this will be equal to m times vcm, which will be equal to the sum of the, the pieces, right? So we've got two pieces here, so we only need to add up two of them. We have m1 times v1. These are both initial, so I'm just kind of going to write the sub i on it. 
plus m2 times v2, that's the block, but its velocity is zero, so that's just going to be zero, right? So this will be equal to m1 v1, right? Yes. So what is the velocity of the center of mass? Vcm will be equal to this, m1 v1, divided by m. Well, m is just m1 plus m2, right? Yes. So divided by m1 plus m2. And now I can plug some numbers into this and see what that is. So we have uh, 0.01 kilograms times 400 meters per second. That's the speed of the bullet. And we'll divide that by m1 plus m2. That's 0.4 kilograms. 0.4 kilograms. And the fours go away. And that will be 10 meters per second. OK? All right. What about energy? How do you think we define the energy? So let's keep this as, I'm going to need this whiteboard space. I'm going to write up here that VCM we've calculated to be 10 meters per second. Because we're going to need that in a minute. But first, let's talk about energy. This is a little trickier to see. But let me point out first that if I take the velocity of any particle, right? Yeah. You can write that as the velocity of the center of mass of all the particles, plus what I'm going to call a relative velocity. So these would all be vectors, OK? So the, if I take a particular particle here, if it's traveling with some velocity v sub i, right? The i means that it's a particular part. We'll call this particle number 7, OK? If the center of mass is, say, here, right? And it has some velocity, right? V, C, M. This should be equal to this plus the relative velocity of this particle. So what is the relative velocity of this particle? Relative velocity of this particle. You know, I think it's easier to see if I do a one-dimensional problem. All right, so let's think about that for a second, OK? And since we just got done with relativity, let's put this thing on a train, right? And let's say this train is moving along with some speed. We'll call it V, C, M. See where I'm going with that, right? And inside that train, you've got some ball bouncing around or whatever, right? And it's going to have some velocity, right? But on the train, of course, the velocity that you see, right, is the ui, right? Yeah. That is a relative velocity because you're on the train, right? You're moving along with it, okay? But to uh, somebody on the platform, let's say, right, to figure out what that velocity is, and I guess I should make it one-dimensional, so we'll have it go in, say, that direction, right? Its velocity is VCM plus UI. This is just the Galilean transformation, OK? I'm not going to throw relativity into it and uh, you know, put a Lorentz transformation in there instead. That would make it unnecessarily complicated. But we'll just use a regular old Galilean transformation. We'll assume that the velocity, both the relative velocity and the center of mass velocity, is very slow compared to the speed of light, right? Yeah. So we can use just the regular Galilean transform. And you can see that's essentially what this is saying, right? Saying that the velocity, right, from some other reference frame, right, that say the VC, the center of mass reference frame is moving with respect to, right, you can think of it as like a cloud of particles floating by, right, you can think of it as a rocket ship that's exploded as it flies through the air, right, yep. that, that, so you have this velocity of the center of mass which is presumably moving with respect to you, right, um, and then with respect to the center of mass all the pieces are doing things, right, it's like being on the train and throwing a ball, so if you're on the train, this is the velocity you see, okay. But from outside, where VCM is, you know, some real quantity, some positive quantity, uh, you would have to add that relative velocity to VCM, okay? Now, if it's in multiple directions, like uh, multiple dimensions, like two or three dimensions, then these things add vectorally, right? I'm not going to complicate it with that, but uh, that's the idea. And so what, what, how would we figure out what the kinetic energy is, right? If we want to write, you know, T, kinetic energy, it's going to be equal to, wait a second, the sum of all the particles, right, times one half m i uh, v i squared, right. Yes. But this is just v i has is this, right? So that's equal to the sum one half m i times v c m plus u i, the relative velocities, right? Yeah. And squared. Really, it's going to be dotted. I could say dot VCM plus UI. This would be the case if we're talking about two or three dimensions where these are vectors. Right? If it's in one dimension, we can just square it as usual. So what is this break? We, but it is like a square. We're going to get a few components here. We're going to get 
a term that looks like sum of one half mi times v cm squared, right? So that would be what we're going to call the kinetic energy of the center of mass, okay? Okay. And then we're going to get, we'll have a term that looks like just the ui squared. It'll be just like this, be sum over all the different particles, one half mi times ui squared, right? All right. And then finally, in the end, right, we're going to have, it'll be two times, so we'll lose the one half, right? This is the, the mixing term. Uh, the sum over, I'm going to pull the velocity, the center of mass velocity out, and I'm going to dot it individually with the sum over all of the UIs, okay? So that's the mixed term. Had a factor of two because you can do it two ways. You've got VCM times UI plus UI times VCM, right? Yeah. It's two, but we had that factor of half, so that just cancels. And I'm using the dot product because if we were thinking of two or three dimensions, then we need to think about vector multiplication and how they dot onto each other or project onto each other rather. And if it's just one dimension though, right, you can, if you think about it long enough, you can, you can convince yourself that this term is really just zero, okay? Okay. When I project all these relative velocities onto it. And I'm going to let you think about that, but if you imagine, you know, if I have a center of mass, right, there must be stuff that's going this way and stuff that's going this way, right? Yes. And this is in the center of all that, right? Yeah. And so if you imagine adding all those relative velocities up, right, you would expect that these are all going to cancel out, okay? Okay. And, and that's essentially what's going on here, okay? So this just totally cancels out, and we're left with just these two terms, and we'll call this one T sub CM, that's the center of mass, kinetic energy, right? Yeah. Plus T, we'll call it rel, for relative. That's the relative kinetic energy, okay? Okay. So what does that mean? So if we have, a, if we have an object and it has some energy. It could be traveling in kind of a uniform way. If none of the, if there's no relative motion, right? Let's say that there's a ball and I smack it, right? Yeah. That energy can go into the ball. It can go into accelerating the center of mass of the ball, making the ball propel forward. But maybe the ball is kind of like jello or rubber or something, and so it wobbles back and forth. So all the component, all the little particles that make it up are in, have relative motion. That energy that I put in there, that's all relative kinetic energy, right? Relative to the center of mass, okay? And this energy will not be immediately available, right? It's not part of the center of mass motion, okay? And so this turns out to be, you know, a pretty important concept in physics and in chemistry as well. Um, when you put energy into a system, sometimes you can get all the energy into the center of mass motion and you can move it, right? You can do work on it, right? Yeah. If I were to push a car very gently, right? I was real gentle about it. I could get all that energy that I put into it into the center of mass motion, and the car is going to move. I'm going to do work, right? Yeah. But if I, like, slam into it with a garbage truck at high speed, I'm putting a lot of energy in, but is it all going to go into the... Is the car just going to shoot off like a rocket? No, of course not. It's going to fly into a million pieces, right? Yeah. All of that, that fly into a million pieces, right, is the, the relative kinetic energy, Okay. And so we can see we see that we can put some in to the relative kinetic energy, some we put into the uh, the, the center of mass kinetic energy. All right, and the, the the debris field will fly forward, but not at the same speed as if all the energy had gone into the center of the mass motion. Okay. Okay. So we'll look at this example here that we just did and try to see that. Um, let me just write down that we have. Uh, T is equal to TCM plus T relative, okay? Right. So if I look at the after picture here, right? Yes. There is no relative motion. The, the bullet is at rest with respect to the block, yes? Yes. So we can write that the TCM is going to be equal to 1 half big M times VCM squared. Well, 1 half M you'll recall is 0.4 kilograms, right? That's the weight of the bullet and the block combined, right? So 0 0.4 kilograms. VCM, which I wrote down to, re to retain over here, is 10 meters per second. So that's 10 meters per second squared. And if I square that out, right, I get, uh, if I square this out, I get 100 uh, times 0.4 uh, times half. So that's going to be 20 joules, okay? Again, to get joules, you have to use units of kilograms and meters per second uh, in your energy calculation, okay? okay? And you'll get joules. What about initially, right? Initially, 
right? The kinetic energy, we'll call it T before. The block was not moving, its velocity is zero, so it contributes nothing to the kinetic energy, yes? yes. So it's all in the bullet, right? It's all in the bullet. So it's one half the mass of the bullet, we'll call it M1, times V1 squared. And that's one half times 0 0.01 kilograms times uh, 400 meters per second squared, right? Yes. If I plug all these values in, that's going to be that's 160,000 uh, divided by 2. It's uh, 80,000, making this uh, 800 joules. I think that's right. Since I said that the kinetic energy is the center of mass kinetic energy plus the relative kinetic energy, yes. right? I can calculate the relative kinetic energy just by simply subtracting these, right? 800 joules minus 20 joules is equal to 780 joules, right? So I've kind of indirectly calculated here. Now I want to directly calculate it. So I don't want to write what these relative velocities are, all right? So the, the relative velocity of u1, right, is going to be it's going to be equal to v1 minus vcm. v1 we already we were given is 400 meters per second, right? So that's 400 meters per second minus vcm we calculated was 10 meters per second. So this is equal to 390 meters per second. Similarly, u2 is going to be equal to v2 minus vcm, but v2 the block initially was not moving, right? Yeah. So it's zero. So you have zero minus 10 meters per second is just minus 10 meters per second. So those are the relative velocities, you see? Yeah. Now I can calculate T1 relative, that's the first particle. That's going to be 1 half M1 uh, times U1, which is going to be equal to 1 half. M1 was 0 0.01, so 0 0.01 kilograms times uh, U1, which we just calculated, was 390 meters per second. If I multiply all this out, we're going to get 760.5 joules. Okay? T2 relative, that's the block. I really should have labeled these block and bullet. Unfortunately, they both have B in them, right? So we just call it particle 1, particle 2. T2 relative is 1 half M2 times U2, which is 1 half M2 is 0 point, or 0 0.39 kilograms, right? Times U2, we just calculated, is minus 10, put a negative sign on there. Uh, 10 meters per second. Oh, yeah, sorry. This was supposed to be squared. Sorry. And we have minus 10, which will be squared. There. Yeah. If I punch that into a calculator, I'll get that that is 19.5 joules. Okay? Oh. T relative, if we calculate it directly, right, should be equal to T1 relative plus T2 relative. Yes? Yes. So that's 760.5 joules plus 19.5 joules. What does that add up to? 779.5. Nope. We have 2.5. We've got 760.5 plus 19.5. So it's 780. Yeah, 780 joules, right? 780 joules, which is exactly what we ascertained earlier. So we can calculate it directly or indirectly, okay? But using this relationship that the kinetic energy is equal to the center of mass kinetic energy plus the relative kinetic energy. Okay? okay. So if we think about these numbers here, the relative, where did most of the energy go into this? Right? We had 800 joules to deposit, right? Yes. If it had all gone into the center of mass motion, right, that thing would be flying forward with some speed, right? Yes. But a bunch of it necessarily got dumped into... Uh, the block, right? Yes. That was kind of unavoidable. We, it doesn't have anything to do with the details of the block or what it's made of, right? This was purely because of conservation of momentum, right? And conservation of energy. Well, conservation of momentum, right? The energy was not conserved. And if we just use Newtonian physics, of course, if we had used special relativity, the mass energy would be conserved, and we would be able to calculate that. We're not going to do that here, so relax. Um, but as you can see, right, the result because of the fact that we said it's inelastic, right, that, that the bullet and the block were moving forward with, with exactly the same velocity, they're moving together, right, yeah. that the relative energy with respect to each other was, uh, the relative velocity rather than zero, right, yeah. both of them are moving along with the center of mass velocity, um, we get this condition that 
a majority of it gets put into the internal state, into the internal motions of it, right? Yes. And a little bit goes into moving the block itself. You see? Yeah. Make sense? Yes. Um, I think as a homework assignment, I'm going to take this idea, and you're going to consider something called a ballistic pendulum. Okay? So what is a ballistic pendulum? Ballistic pendulum, if I had attached this block onto a, uh, you know, I tied it, tied it on with a rope and hung it from, you know, some position such that it could rotate up, and if I allow the block to be heavy enough, then you can measure how high the block swings up, right? Yes. That, of course, is going to have some potential energy, right? Yeah. And you can use how high the block goes up to figure out how fast the bullet was going. So it's a way to measure how fast bullets are. Okay. okay? Right. That's called a ballistic pendulum. So I think that'll be a good homework assignment to, uh, to put to practice uh, some of these ideas. Okay? Okay. All right, next time we're going to talk more about angular motion. We'll talk about polar coordinates. So we've only ever seen Cartesian coordinates, where we represent space with x, y, and z, right? Mm -hmm. And all of our rulers are orthogonal, right? They make 90 degrees to each other. Uh, polar coordinates is a little bit different. Um, and uh, that will lead us into discussing circular motion and eventually orbits, and then we'll get to Kepler's law and gravity and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's where we're headed. So next time we'll talk about angular motion and angular momentum. Okay. Okay. All right.